My conversation today is with Marlena Seven Bremner. Seven stands out as not only an artist possessed of rare talent, but the brilliance of her work is informed by a profound understanding of Hermeticism, alchemy, and Jungian psychology. Her synthetic philosophy, consisting of a unification and practical application of these in her life and work as a visual artist, is elaborated in her latest book, released this year by Inner Traditions, entitled The Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy, Imagination, Creativity, and the Great Work, which is the second part of a conceptual series begun in her previous release, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy. The Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy is an initiatory guide, offering a practical means for liberating the authentic creator within and for the attainment of true self-knowledge. Her writing is characterized by the same beauty and clarity and marked by the same mysteriousness as her art. We sat down to talk about art, alchemy, the power and significance of the imagination as a creative and magical tool, and much more. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. When I first started getting into art um, as a serious practice and improving my technical skills and everything, I was also going through a really difficult period in my life. And at the same time, I had come across um, Carl Jung's work on alchemy. And so I started to combine these alchemical processes with my creative practice as a way to transmute this difficult energy that I was dealing with and all of these emotions and sort of um, repressed traumas that were coming to the surface and things that I hadn't dealt with in my life. Um, And through that sort of alchemical projection of what was going on within me into this external form, I was able to see um, things more clearly and kind of start a communication with the unconscious. And this went on for many years and I was able to see that dark material kind of transform into different stages of the alchemical process. And as I went through this, um, I wrote a lot in my journals, but I also started writing just about alchemy and about symbols and all of it just coalesced over many years. And my research deepened. I went further into hermeticism and um, my magical practice was deepening and all of it being kind of centered around the creative process. So at a certain point, um, maybe like eight years ago or so, it really started to feel like a book. And so I started to kind of think about it that way and organize it that way. And all these different pieces started to coalesce, you know, into, um, into one book. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how it came together. And then um, I moved out to the desert a few years ago and got the deal with inner traditions. And then that's when they really, um, fully took shape interesting that's very interesting uh yeah i, I had a, sim- uh, a a similar experience myself believe it or not i um i be- uh, uh you went did you did i hear correctly that you went to school for polarity therapy as well i did yeah yeah i spent five years training um, yeah so i i um that's amazing uh, I, I ended up going back to school. I was my, my uh, medium of choice has always been music. It's been sound. I, I would love to have been uh, a visual artist, but I just didn't have the the chops. And, and uh, I have a lot of uh, kinetic sort of nervous energy, mental energy. And um, so I need to move. Right. So I, I play the, I played the drums. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. You know, you're, you're yeah, you're, you're constantly moving. Uh, whereas, you know, Visual art for me, I was sort of in one place for a little too long. It was very, it was a very good Zen exercise, but I did music for a long time. And then I actually ended up putting that down for a little while to go back to school for massage and body work, which eventually led me into uh, acupuncture and, um, and Chinese medicine. So, uh, and during that time, yeah, I was kind of the same deal going through the dark night of the soul and, uh, being initiated into a magical lineage and and uh an energy healing modality i did reiki also um and yet it it kind of just 
you get pulled in you're following breadcrumbs at a certain point i mean that that's the way i felt it was like there was never any intention to go down that path people are super surprised when i tell them like i had no idea what magic was i had no idea what the golden dawn was i just kind of ended up there they're like what i'm like yeah i just these people were talking about magic. I, I thought they fancied themselves like, you know, like Harry Potter people. But I was like, hey, I'll stick around. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very much like just following the breadcrumbs for me. One thing just led to another. You know, someone gave me Carl Jung's book, Psychology and Alchemy. And then, you know, I started coming across other alchemical texts and trying to decipher them myself and just being completely confounded. But, you know, you spend enough time mm -hmm reading them, the symbols just start to penetrate into your being. And then if you're creating something, whether it's art or music or poetry or whatever it is, it starts to kind of filter through. And it's through that expression that you really start to understand it, I think, you know, once it's like moving through you and becomes like a living thing. And that's right. what happened for me. And so all these different alchemical processes I would experience through the art and through my body and through my psyche and um, amazing transformations took place, but it wasn't all overnight, you know, just, um, and magic was the same way for me. It wasn't like I stepped into a magical order. I mean, studying polarity therapy is kind of like an initiation mm -hmm. and I studied, you know, got the Reiki attunement as well and had different energy teachers and spiritual teachers through that time. And so it was very much like an initiation, but um, not in the sense of like a hermetic order or something, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th that's the thing also. I kind of had both back to back. I had an initiation uh, uh, into, you know, a hermetic initiatic lineage. And then a week later I did, uh, I did my first Reiki attunement and I, I felt like they complemented each other so well. It's like one had the side, the other was missing. But mm. uh, but to your point about um, about the, the the sort of saturation of of the symbolic image, this is a very Rosicrucian idea. This idea that like no, the the symbols are the teachings themselves. Everything else is commentary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and everybody has their own unique way of viewing the symbols, you know, and talking about them, and so every alchemist you read says that they are the the one true um source for this information and um you know they like to tout their own stuff but like every everyone is unique in how they approach it and how they describe it and how they take it in yeah yeah, yeah I, th there's there's a quote actually that i i wanted to bring to you from your book mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously talking at length about the imagination uh, as key to the process, you know, a lot of people view it as, as, as you mentioned, quote unquote, unreal. Um, but I really love the way you put it, the, the wondrous capability of, of the mind to form new ideas. Um, and that kind of, for me, it brought up this idea of... I felt for a really long time, like what I was doing artistically, musically was imitating. And, but my imitation was informed by my subjective experience. And so, you know, and to your point, right, this idea of each alchemist thinking they're the only one that gets it or knows it, you know, there's something there to like your, your originality being tied to your subjective experience, you know, because you can't, it's kind of like with, I like to use the analogy of music and cooking, right? I can't create any new ingredients, but I can mix them together in a way that is unique to my experience. Yeah. And in a way, all creation is like that, right? We're working with what's here, the elements that are here around us and recombining them into new and novel forms. And everything that can be essentially already is, it exists in the state of potential, you know, and that's what that alchemical primal matter is, the prima materia. And all of the elements are contained within that prima materia. And we're just kind of reaching into it and bringing order to that chaos and shaping it into new forms that are um, yeah, filtered through our own subjective lens and how yeah. we see the world. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it's very interesting too, because the artist kind of plays the role of the, 
it's a type of magic. You're a type of magician, really. You know, when you see, uh, you know, you've got that classic archetypal image of the 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 magician and the Rider Waite tarot deck, Rider mm -hmm. Waite Smith tarot deck, kind of like this. You know, implying that I'm bridging the above and the below. They unite mm -hmm. in me. I'm the mediator. In, mm -hmm. in Chinese medicine, they'd call that uh, bridging heaven and earth. And mm -hmm. uh, the tools are of the magician are, are the elements, you know, the, 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 the zodiacal and planetary forces. And these are the, these are the kind of intermediaries uh, that the, uh, the tree of prima are able to work through and move through. They use these, these essences and these forces. And um, the magician really is the mediating point. And I think it was really interesting because um, you definitely discussed in your book also um, about finding that that balance you know between uh opening up uh to the the intuition but then also you know requiring skill you know like mm -hmm. you you obviously you're you're self-taught right you're self-taught visual yeah. artist yeah so you, you probably had to spend quite a while you know honing the actual uh the the acquisition of those physical tangible skills in order for your intuition to be able to move through you exactly yeah yeah you acquire through practice that technical skill that allows you to freely express what's coming through with the intuition and the inspiration so that you become just this channel for that divine energy moving through you like you're saying the magician being the medium the mm -hmm. artist is very similar the you know once you have that technical ability, then you can really allow that energy to move through you spontaneously without um, any hindrance from the rational mind. And so then you can get into the uh, surrealist mm -hmm. realms of automatism, you know, and like allowing that divine spirit to move through you or allowing the unconscious to express itself through you, however you want to look at it. Yeah. I think, I think artists too are, I one of the things I don't like to do is I particularly with musicians because I am one and I was I've been around uh them a lot in my life. I don't I don't necessarily always like to take the approach of like patting myself on the back for for being an artist. Uh but it, in reality we do spend more time than the average person in proximity to our subconscious, you know, and our and our unconscious. And it's almost like it, it can feel sometimes like there's, there's this permeability that's there. It's almost like we keep the, the attic door open, you know, in the house doesn't really get shut. So, you know, it's, it's like the analogy is like, if, if there's a noise up there, we're a little more attentive to it. You know, things that move through the subconscious are way more easily, uh, well, they can become intrusive, frankly, uh, I think, to to an artist that spends a lot of time trying to to tap what's in there. But um, I think that people like that make really good magicians. I think that that's why there's a lot of crossover. Have you found that to be the case? Like, how did you go from, from what what at what point did you if there was like a, de, a, a somewhat of a definitive moment, what, what point did you say? I'll give the, I'll give magic a shot. I'll give the, I'll give this a try. I'll, I'll see what, you know, if this is, it lives up to the hype or. Well, I mean, magic has been a part of my life since I was a kid, really. You know, I, I remember very distinctly as a kid thinking like, wow, you know, most of the adults around me don't believe in magic anymore. And I don't want to be like that when I grow up. And so I kind of, you know, intentionally was holding on to that. And then in my teen years came across all kinds of stuff that helped me explore that in different ways, um, particularly like just, you know, pagan Wiccan traditions, um, natural magic. And that led into an interest in the healing arts. And that's a sort of magical practice as well, feeling energy and tapping into your own auric body and that sort of thing. Um, but with the occult magic that came a little bit later and um, I don't know, I guess it just sort of streamed right into it. It wasn't like a definitive moment of, you know, deciding it was just interesting to me to um, 
to think of magic in a new way, you know, in terms of the occult and um, this different lineage and uh, a more ritualistic way of working with it and also tying it in with the planets and the heavenly spheres and all of that. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I feel like r ritual is it's the way that a painting can be a sort of frozen archetype. I feel that ritual is the enactment of archetype. You know, that's if there's anything that allowed me uh, or sort of made me suspend my disbelief because I did enter into it with 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 quite a bit of disbelief. Um, that I had to work through. I, I was just conscious of that, that, that fight. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I didn't run. I, I stayed with it. But if there's anything that pulled me through, it's, it's sort of like this, it felt like I was enacting some kind of like mythology, which was something I really enjoyed because again, that's an archetypal sort of symbolic image. And, and that's something that, you know, I love the fact that you address a lot of Jungian stuff in, uh, in your book. Um, the hermetic marriage of art and alchemy <clears throat> that that really struck me in particular one thing that i was i was wondering actually so i came across polarity therapy by way of massage therapy i don't know too much about it mm -hmm. is there a lot of hands-on manipulation oh yeah yeah it's um like a very simplistic way to describe it would be that it's um like a combination of massage and reiki so you've got the physical manipulation going on but also that energy but the difference is you're working with the energetic structure of the body so you know where the elements um all exist in the body you know how the polarities are um in relationship to each other all throughout the body and so any physical manipulations that you're doing whether that's like a deep acupressure type of point or like a rocking motion or um other manipulations of the tissue, all of that is within the context of the energy and where the energy is moving. And as opposed to Reiki, where you're like channeling this energy through you into a person, you're just working with that person's life force. And you're using both hands to create that polarity of the positive and negative and to channel that life force where it naturally wants to go. But it gets blocked up for different reasons. And that results in physical illness, emotional distress, mental um, distress, and all of that. And so opening those blockages um, by releasing the energy, and sometimes that's done physically, sometimes it's just a very light, like off the body, even um, energetic touch. That sounds really, uh, that actually sounds really appealing from my point of view, because, <laughs> because of the, you know, this, the training I had massage therapy and Reiki kind of at the same time. And I, I wasn't really fully aware of, of what polarity therapy was, but one thing that I I'm kind of interested in is this, again, this, there's this crossover in people that we have so much of our consciousness in our hands, you know, like musicians and, and people who draw and people who paint. And when I was in massage school, I saw a lot of people um, that were into the arts specifically you know part of me is like maybe it's because they they only wanted to work a certain amount of hours a week <laughs> <laughs> but then you know i was thinking you know there is something to that um mm. exp expression through uh th through our hands you know frankly uh, uh there's i think there, there's that there's something there well, and we have all the elements in our fingers, right? We've got the four elements here, and then the fifth element or the quintessence, the etheric element um, that unites all of them. And so then we have the two polarities of those elements. Each one has its own polarity um, dynamic. And so, yeah, we're working with the elements in magic. We're working with the elements in creation and in healing as well. And yeah, yeah. And all of that, you know, I, I like to think about the hands and the arms and the connection with the heart and the heart kind of being that center point for the above and the below and everything kind of like moving through that point. Um, and all of that being the heart being so quintessential to all of those practices. Yeah. Yeah. So how much of your of your art is directly influenced by your spiritual practice? In other words, do you have to get yourself into a meditative state? Do you do, do you practice any energy work before or, or during? 
you know, occasionally I will do some kind of like meditation before, but it's such a daily practice for me that the, the painting is the practice. Um, Mm. and there are different aspects of it that require different rituals, I would say. Um, if I am really wanting to work with the unconscious and allow something to come through, that's, um, revelatory, um, then I have a practice of creating a prima materia on my canvas before I start painting. And so it's just one color applied very thickly. And then I, in a sort of trance state, um, vigorously rub off the paint with a rag, but in a very chaotic way. So it leaves all these patterns of like light and dark and like lines and curves and all of this stuff. And then I can continue the trance state and gaze into it um, for as long as I need to, until I see what the painting wants to be and what it wants to communicate to me. Um, And so that's my way of kind of getting out of the way of the process. Um, And other times I have like a very idealized concept that I want to express. And so I'll take time to like, um, you know, collect all the symbols I want to work with, um, geometries, um, develop the composition, do a number of sketches, you know, and then apply that to the canvas. And so it's more of a linear process. Mm. And I see that as sort of like a integrative process. Like I've gone through a bunch of things in my life and learned some things and that's the integration, the moment of like completion, you know? Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. It's, it sounds extremely balanced, actually. Uh, it's almost it, it, to me. It sounds like the. It almost sounds like scrying, you know, like crystal gazing when you're when it you're. Is. you're yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, do you have any? Do you utilize any kind of um, uh, crossover, like the consonants between something like uh, audio and and visual? Do you do you listen to music? Do you source any of your inspiration from from things that are not necessarily visual? Well. I don't know. It's hard to say because I feel like a lot of my inspiration is just from everything that I'm experiencing, everything that I'm reading, the conversations that I'm having, um, the observations I have out in nature, um, dreams, especially dreams. And yeah, music, because when you're in that sort of what I consider to be like an alchemical dissolution where the subjective and the objective start to merge together and you're kind of submersed in that world of symbols and inspiration and dreams and the unconscious. And like you said, it can be kind of intrusive and you got to keep one foot on the ground, you know, to be able to navigate it without losing your mind. But a little bit of that um, madness, divine madness, I think is necessary. And so being in that liminal space and allowing messages to come through and sometimes, yeah, it's lyrics in a song will speak to me and tell me exactly what I need to hear in that moment. Um, And sometimes that happens when I'm painting and it'll like influence the direction of the painting. So I do listen to a lot of music and um, oftentimes will choose the type of music um, based on the process that I'm doing in the painting. You know, if I'm doing really fine detailed work at the end of a painting and I need a lot of focus, usually it's just something light and instrumental or atmospheric. But if I'm doing that prima materia, you know, that scrying type of um, creating the prima materia to gaze into something really active or trance inducing is helpful for that to get out of the way, you know, and to allow myself to create those patterns with the rag without any um, rational conscious intention behind it. Mm. Yeah, that's that that, that's how uh, music can work for me. I think a lot of times is I I can it can help get me to uh, a state that I'm just not currently in, which can be th- there. There came this point in my life when I realized like I was, what I was doing was like, I would feel a certain way. Like I'd have some sort of underlying emotional content and I would ch- select music that augmented that. Whereas now, <laughs> now it's like, you know, but kind of speaking to your point of getting yourself out of the way, it's it, it sounds to me more like, you know, you're you're kind of going with the flow rather than than trying to, you know, being in in that recept trying to create that receptive sort of uh, womb or liminal space so that something's moving through you 
And I think early on in a lot of art, just struggling through it, you're trying to find what you have, what you, right? like your ego, your personality, what do I have to say? What, mm -hmm. what do I, exp what can I express? What's my emotional content that I need to, that I need to vent. But uh, it's, it sounds like you've kind of reached a, a different level in your, your process, which is intriguing to me because I, by the time I had kind of come to those realizations, I had stopped making, you know, art. So it's, it's very interesting to me to see like, or, or to, to maybe like uh, uh, fantasize what, what would have been different. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like my early art, I did have like a clear intention. I wanted to um, portray the unseen. You know, I wanted to give expression to energy. And a lot of that came from my training in polarity therapy and other things that I'd studied before that. Um, from a young age, I really wanted to express that, being able to see energy. Um, and so for me, mm. I was able to do that uh, through visual art. And I think that, you know, that transformed into wanting to, and this goes back to something you were saying earlier, wanting to experience myth and the archetypes um, in my own life, through my body, through my emotions and my experience, and then to express what I learn um, creatively. And so I think all of these things, magic and um, alchemy, like it's important to have a physical a way to bring it into the physical world and to transmute things through the physical world in some way. And um, I think with myth as well, the gods are living through us, you know, like we are keeping them alive through our stories. And we can often, when we're going through something intense in our lives, we can often find a myth that sort of encapsulates what we're going through. And usually one of the characters in the myth, not necessarily the main one is sort of, um, embodying that experience that we're having in the myth and to personalize it, you know, to bring it into the personal sphere and to have that experience is really powerful. And then to be able to transmute it through the creative process. Um, yeah, I think it's, it can be really profound and that's what I really want to encourage people to do is to have that personal experience and, um, bring that into their lives. Yeah, I noticed that one of the the things that you were you were sort of um, one of the through lines of of what you, what you were talking about in your book is kind of um, developing or expressing your creative genius, mm -hmm. uh, and I really liked where you were going with that because uh, you know this idea of of the genius, right? Um, actually, going back to really Thomas Taylor translating all the platonic stuff and then and the neoplatonic stuff mm -hmm. he, he used the word genius for the, the 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 higher you know diamond the sort of the i i don't i personally i don't see a one-to-one -one correspondence to them but i think a lot of people use the term holy guardian angel like that aspect mm -hmm. of your of your spiritual architecture which is higher than your your persona and uh so i thought that was like really apropos because that's encouraging somebody to i really loved that like go to the root go to the source find the spiritual impetus for all of this and and you know tap that you know use that as the 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 wellspring uh for your art i think and that's like the great secret right people kind of have this idea that we, we call people geniuses and we think that they've just accumulated a lot of rote knowledge yeah. or information. And in reality, it's like something else coming through them. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like um, clearing out, getting out of the way and just allowing that divine inspiration, that genius to flow through. But I think that's where the alchemy comes in because oftentimes we have, you know, we've got our different energy centers and our, um, above and below the conscious and unconscious. And there's all these different um, ways that those parts of ourselves can be corrupted and that keep us from being a clear channel for these energies and being able to <clears throat> go into the caverns of the minds, go internally, enter that dark space and retrieve these raw ores and bring them to the surface and kind of say, okay, what, this is what I have to work with. 
And um, I'm going to do my best to transmute this into its most exalted form, you know, and we all have like the basic raw ores of our being and things that we um, accumulated in this lifetime and lifetimes before and inherited um, from our ancestors and our family and from our culture. And so there's this process of purification and refinement of this material. And through that, we can reach that uh, divine genius within us or the philosopher's stone as it's called in alchemy, like the Holy grail of alchemy. Um, and we all have that philosopher's stone already, but it's a matter of um, clarifying it and refining it and bringing it to perfection so that it has its like full true potency and power. Mm. Yeah. It's one thing that I find um, that I found always so apropos it, it, It's just so I had so many levels of complexity and I, I'm not sure how he meant it. And this is incredibly cheesy, but I used to love when I was a kid watching Bob Ross. Um, <laughs> I'd like who didn't right? that, that, you know, was a kid in the eighties and nineties. Um, yeah. And he always used to say, you need the dark to see the light. Like he said it on like almost every episode. And <laughs> you know, the older I get, the more I realize he probably wasn't just talking about painting. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So um, you are, you've, you have, uh, you mentioned that in the last couple of years you have relocated to the desert. Yep. I, I spent 12 and a half years up in the Northwest um, based in Olympia, Washington. And then I think it was 2019. I moved out here to New Mexico and pretty much with the intention of like, being in a more uh, hermetic environment to finish the books. Um, but also, you know, I needed a environmental change. I needed to dry out physically. Um, and yeah, in, in so many ways, um, I felt just completely saturated up there and it's a very lunar environment. And for mm -hmm. me, I originally came from the desert and went to the Northwest because, um, I wanted more water. I wanted trees. I wanted green and that kind of nurturing womb-like environment. And what happened was it actually helped me go into that unconscious world and the world of the dreams and like connect with the mother archetype and um, tap into my creativity and everything. And so Olympia especially is like a really nurturing place for creativity and for budding artists and creators. And that's what I found there. But at a certain point, um, yeah, I felt like I needed to return to a more solar environment and also a more soulful, expansive experience. Um, being able to see in all directions, you know, and like sit on a hill and just look out over a vast landscape and <laughs> contemplate, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, place definitely has, uh, you know, your environment particularly the one that you go to at the end of the day, right. Mm -hmm. When to come home somewhere is so incredibly important. Um, have you found that that has kind of, I mean, inevitably influenced some of the things that you're, that you're creating or thinking about in terms of, you know, uh, creative or, or, or magical, uh, has it affected your subconscious? You know, I think it has, um, I know that before I moved out here and this was sort of a magical intentional practice I was doing was I started incorporating desert imagery into my paintings to help manifest the transition to the desert. And that imagery has continued to um, evolve over time. Um, so I end up painting more desert imagery, I feel like, and I've also painted a lot of imagery of like just open skies or like clouds in the sky. And that's something you see a lot here is just like blue, blue sky with the clouds passing by. And, um, but yeah, I do feel like there's more clarity in my consciousness as opposed to being up in the Northwest. I, I feel emotionally more calm, um, less brooding. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I think, yeah, the dark, cloudy atmosphere up there is very conducive to some brooding, especially for me. So yeah, I, I just feel a little lighter here, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's kind of, uh, 
it's interesting in Chinese medicine, there's this idea that the exterior landscape will be mirrored to some degree on the interior. It's kind of like what you were saying, feeling this need to quote unquote dry out uh, or, or have more, more water. Um, but I think also I, I recently moved to the mountains in Western North Carolina. I moved from New York. So I, I had lived in, um, in New York city for many years. Uh, I grew up out on, on Long Island, which is a very, very flat place. <laughs> you, like you're saying, you can see in, in every direction. And um, yeah, moving here changed in a lot of ways, like particularly in dreams and things like that. It it, it changed some of the imagery, my, like my personal mythos, you know, that, that available kind of like symbolic toolbox, the way that you ex- express uh, things to yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a lot of stuff that I just didn't understand coming from up north, you know, uh, in terms of uh, certain like, I didn't really resonate with uh, the Native American Indian kind of aesthetic. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really understand it. Um, you know, the, the, the bright colors and, uh, and then the, the pastels and things like that and, and lots of feathers. And you kind of come here and some of that incorporates itself into you to a degree because, you know, really what they were being influenced by was the energy of the land, right? The moving organism yeah. of the place where they exist. And, and that has, you know, I've got hawks that are kind of, there's like 12 in the air right now, you know, it's like, and I just not used to seeing any of that stuff. And now it's just constantly uh, saturating me. And, and this is historically, uh, you know, Appalachia. This is a place that has a very strong sort of sense of place and, and folk traditions here that I'm, you know, I'm still, I still stick out like a sore thumb. But mm-hmm. <laughs> so what's next uh what's next on the horizon for you are you planning another book are you uh have you got any um uh are you showing in any galleries or anything like that i do have a couple shows um i have some work in europe right now that's moving to a show in london in october and then a show in austin but we don't have a date set for that yet it'll probably probably be next year. And then um, a potential show in Seattle this fall as well. Um, but otherwise, I I have a Patreon where I all my kind of current writing goes. Um, and right now I'm really focused on the astrological decans, the 36 decans. And so every 10 days I'm writing a new post about um, the current decan that we're in. And kind of giving an overview of the different images associated with it. And for those who don't know, the Deccans are um, at a basic level, they're like subdivisions of the zodiac. So each zodiac sign has uh, three 10 degree segments and each one is a different Deccan. So there's 36 for the year. And um, they've had different meanings um, since ancient times. It goes back to ancient Egypt and the way that they track time. Um, by the rising of different stars every 10 days. And um, they've been associated with spirits and gods and also just with images um, of like basic human behavior, you know, Mm -hmm. like a a man standing with a a flute in one hand and a pipe in the other or something like that, you know. And so you can use them as like images for contemplation, but they're also useful in magic and for creating talismans and stuff like that um so i'm working on that right now and kind of doing what some people have called a deccan walk and just through the year studying each deccan and writing about it as a way for myself to deepen my understanding of them and it may very well um turn into a book at some point because that's usually what seems to happen Um, that's awesome yeah and then i'd like to have it be kind of a multi-year project where this year is just the research and writing and then next year is maybe creating art for each of the decans. Um, so I've got that going on on my Patreon. And um, other than that, just I'm enjoying the space to spend time in the studio. And I've got probably like seven different paintings in progress right now. And um, doing a Zodiac series and then one commission. And um, it's just been nice to have after 
finishing the books to have like lots of time in the studio and every day kind of that's the main focus of the day is being up there and working on one of the paintings. Yeah, that's, yeah, you've got a lot going on. That's excellent. That's excellent. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I recently actually just got back from a, uh, a trip to Egypt and, um, mm -hmm. I actually, I went to uh, the Dendera temple where the, the, you know, the famous Zodiac is. And yeah. I guess I, I didn't realize that the original is not there. So. I know I had the same disappointing realization when I was there last year. Yeah. 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 It, it's, uh, and it's also, it's also interesting to me too. The, um, the 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 fact that all of that pigment stayed up on those walls is insane and you know they were using such vibrant colors like primary colors it was like really really um visually intense oh yeah yeah i was astounded by that especially at dendera that blue it's like this blue here you know and the, just the amount <laughs> of detail on every single edifice you know just everything and that color especially yeah yeah there, there's a certain point in um in the golden dawn uh trajectory where you begin to work what's called like color magic the color scales yeah and uh you know you know we're exposed to a lot of images between the internet and the phones and yeah. advertisements and stuff and it, you, it just it seems like a little bit of overstimulation. On the other hand, you walk into an Egyptian temple and you're like, well, I don't know. It seems like there's been a lot of color and a lot of crazy kind of shit going on for, for, for millennia. But um, when I started really working with the color magic stuff, mm -hmm. stuff would just pop. It was almost like my eyes were drinking, you know, mm -hmm. it was like very, very interesting to have, um, to have that experience. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, glorify artistic people necessarily uh, in terms of a value judgment but i will say that i i recently read a quote somewhere on the internet and it, it went something like only only the artist truly sees only the musician truly hears it's almost like you have to you know you have to expand your consciousness and develop the ability to truly listen or truly yeah you know, look at something and absorb everything. Do you, do you find that that's true in, 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 in art in visual art? That you have to expand your consciousness to really take things in. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You know, it, like looking at something, really looking at something and absorbing the detail. Is that something that you felt like you always had an innate ability to do, or did you have to develop that? A little bit of both. I mean, to be fair, I come from a family of artists. And while nobody like sat down and taught me things, <laughs> per se, um, there was a lot of that influence. And I think I have that just in my blood, you know, that artistic um, mm -hmm. proclivity and kind of innate talent. But I don't think I was very good until I put in the practice and took that time to really like um, apply myself. And so I actually didn't start painting until my mid twenties because I just didn't think I was very good. Um, wow. Yeah. And maybe it was because I had some amazing artists in my family and, you know, compared to that, it's like, what am I doing? Uh, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it took me a while to even like want to approach it as a serious uh, discipline. And, and then, yeah, to be able to really see something and portray it because I do work in a surreal way, but then I like to bring in that real element. Um, and so I'll use reference images after I kind of have the basic idea of what's happening to bring in that real aspect and reality to it. Cause I, I like to be able to feel things, you know, it's like things are popping off the canvas, you know, there's a three dimensionality um, or a hyper reality to it. And so to be able to observe an object can be really hard to actually determine what you're seeing you know and just to yeah. me that's fascinating in itself is like how the eyes perceive reality and you can think you're seeing something a certain way and then after like weeks of trying to portray it in a painting suddenly you realize like you've been seeing it all wrong 
and there's this whole aspect that you've been missing, you know, and that's happened to me so so many times. So I think it is um, a discipline and a practice to be able to, to see things and to hear things and experience things in a full way. Yeah. I I had to develop my ear um, quite a bit and it came to me in the form of like advice, wasn't even aware that that was something that I had to do. I thought music was just, you know, yeah, you just do it. But um, <laughs> took a really long time. And even still, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll go back and listen to a song that I, you know, I, that I've, I've been listening to for many years. And I'll, like you're saying, I'll, I'll hear like, I've been, I've been hearing and singing the wrong harmony for like 10 years. <laughs> so it's like a totally <laughs> note. I'm just inserting myself in there. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so um, I have a couple of canned questions that everybody gets. Sure. Um, well, the first one that I want to ask you is um, how do you, how is it that you experience magic? And uh, I feel like I, I have to clarify it because it's a very vague question. And most people look at me uh, slightly askance, but I used to ask people how they would define it. And it kind of, all boiled down to this semantic thing. And so I'm, I'm more interested in like, what's the experiential content of, of, of magic or, or anything mystical for you, you know, and that doesn't have to be exclusively ritual from what I'm hearing. I mean, your painting sounds magical, like that whole process. Well, I do practice some ritual magic and I do consider my creative practice to be a magical practice. Um, but I also feel like I experience magic just in the mundane aspects of everyday life, you know, um, usually I'll have some sort of thing that I'm meditating on or like an issue in my life that is unresolved or, um, that's creating some sort of tension, you know, and Mm -hmm. I allow everything that I experience in my reality to kind of inform that process of unraveling that or um, transmuting it or evolving it and seeing what wants to happen. And so sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll walk outside and I'll just see something happen in the sky. Like the other day I walked out of my house and there was a, a raven chasing a hawk right over the property where I live, like right on its tail, you know? And to me, that was a very clear message about something that I was dealing with, you know, um, sometimes it's a dream, you know, and, um, there's alchemical processes that are happening in my dreams. Like the other night I had, there were piles of wet leaves that were going to be burned, you know, so this Mm -hmm. transmutation from the wet to the dry and, um, or there'll be a message in my dream that I should, take more baths or something. And so then it's like, (laughs) Oh, maybe I need some more like feminine, like submersive experiences, you know? So yeah, that's how I see magic um, in a general sense. And then every once in a while, I feel really called to do some sort of ritual or to connect with a certain planetary archetype. And I go through phases of being doing like a regular daily practice with the planets. And um, it just depends on, on where I'm at, I guess. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and the the other question that I I always ask everybody, uh, and the real difficult one about this is its limitation. For anybody that's listened to this episode, you know this conversation that we've had, and might be interested in, um, you know, getting a little bit more into source material. You know, we've talked about alchemy, we've talked about uh, her- hermetism, hermeticism, art. Could you list three books or? any kind of media or major influences that, that you think people would, would benefit by checking out. You can list your own. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. My two books. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Well, actually um, I have a good friend. His name is Brian Cotenoir and maybe you're familiar with his work. He's written some really wonderful stuff about alchemy and I highly recommend reading his work. Um, I think the one is called, Poetry of Matter. I hope I'm not messing that up. Um, Excellent book about the great work. And then one called Alchemy that just came out. And I just got it the other day. I'm super excited about it. I haven't even had time to dig into it yet, but um, definitely check out Brian Cotenoir. 
And I'm a big fan of the Corpus Hermeticum and that's like a big subject in my first book. So um, I really like Copenhaver's translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. And that's, I think just called the Hermetica and also GRS Mead who has more of kind of a um, mystical theosophical approach to the whole thing. And mm. um, that's called Thrice Greatest Hermes. And so I definitely recommend those if you're interested in exploring the um, hermetic tradition. And as far as like books on other books on alchemy that I really like that have been a big influence, um, Johann, Johannes Fabricius um, in his book called mm -hmm. The Alchemists and Their Royal Art. And it's just filled yes. with alchemical art and a very kind of psychological approach to it, which I like but also very mystical. And um, he really digs into all of the symbology and also gets into the Zodiac and all of that. So that was a big influence um, in my own study of alchemy. And I definitely recommend that one. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, Marlena Seven Bremner, thank you so much for being on with me today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm very excited. Uh, to see what else you've got going on. I'm going to keep my my eyes and ears open for that third book on the deck ends eventually. <laughs> <laughs> eventually. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this was great. I thank you so much for having me on. Wonderful to talk to you today. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.